I'm going to ask you this morning to open up your Bibles and turn over to 3 John. 3 John is where we're going to be looking here in just a moment this morning. But before we turn there, we want to take this opportunity to welcome each and everyone here with us this morning. We do have quite a few visitors with us today. We're excited to have you here. We're excited that we're able to come together and worship God. We're excited that we're able to have this opportunity to, to try to put the things of this world, those, those, those ever intrusive thoughts, out of our mind and solely focus on God and on what His, say, or what his Son has done, what our Savior has has done for us. It is truly a wonderful, wonderful thing. This morning, I want us to remember the the past three weeks or so, because over these past three weeks, we've really had a a common type of thought, a common type of thing, and that is our worries and our anxieties. We've looked at many things that have to do with them, and we've looked at how we overcome them. That's been one of the, the major, major focuses over these past few weeks. How do we overcome our worries or anxieties? We've looked at things like we have to be able to recognize that we have worries. We have to be able to recognize we have these anxieties, but we have to make sure that we do not dwell on them. We've looked at the fact that we need to change our mindset, and when we talked about changing our mindset, we made sure in a lesson all of its own to to recognize what does that mean. And it means that we have to humble ourselves, and so we looked at how is it that we humble ourselves? And what process do we go through? What things do we do to help ourselves become humble? We talked a little bit last week about changing our support. You know, when we look at things that we put our trust in, that we put our faith in, we have to change that. If we truly want to overcome these worries and these anxieties, we have to change it. We looked at trust and we also looked last week at its benefits at what trust actually gives us. And ultimately what it gives us, we looked at, was peace. And how we're able to have that. This morning, what we're going to do is kind of finish up this mini-series. And what we're going to look at is changing our sustenance, but more specifically, changing our sustenance from self or from above. This morning, we're going to use the words, though, self-focus or self-centered. And the reason that we're going to use these words is because these two things are not the same. It's not the same to say that somebody who is self-focused is self-centered. They are indeed different. And so we're going to look this morning and see how are they different. Is one good? Is one bad? Are they both good? Are they both bad? And we're going to find what does it tell us. Now, as we've been doing, we want to talk about, well, why are we doing it? Why are we talking about our self-focus or our self-centeredness? And we could look at at many obvious reasons, really. We could look at the fact that this self-centeredness plagues mankind. Look throughout history. Look throughout the time that we live today. It truly is abundant. And it always has been. It always has been abundant. And when we look at it, it's really because we're molded to be that way. And I'm not saying we're molded by God. I'm saying we're molded by society. Society has this way of of telling us that we have to be concerned solely for ourselves. That that's who we have to care about. How often do we hear, put number one first, and who they refer to as number one? Well, me, right? Myself, I'm number one. And so we have to realize that that's one of the reasons we need to talk about it. We need to talk about it because it has always been, as we already mentioned, a struggle. And it always will be. We can look at places like over in Genesis chapter 4. We're not going to turn there this morning. But over in Genesis chapter 4, we see the story of Cain and Abel. What pushed Cain, what caused Cain to go and murder his brother? Well, jealousy. Jealousy because Cain was focused on why his sacrifice was not accepted by God. Or we can look at where our scripture reading was from this morning over in Acts chapter 5. What pushed Ananias and Sapphira, what pushed them to lie before God? What pushed them to say that this is all of the proceeds from the land that we sold, when indeed it wasn't? Well, it was their self-centeredness. Their focus was on them. They said, well, we're going to, we want the benefits that come from saying, yes, look at what we did. But we also want the benefits that come from, well, there's, there's some money here. They were focused on themselves. 
But while we can look at these things and, and say, well, there's enough reason right in and of itself to, to say we need to talk about it. But there's actually some more. And some of the more reasons that we're going to talk about it is simply because we often make a choice not to. We often make a choice that we really don't bring up self-centeredness. We don't bring up self-focus. And ultimately, what does it do when we make a decision not to bring something up? It doesn't mean and it doesn't make it where, okay, I didn't talk about it, so it must not exist, right? No. If you decide not to talk about something, what do you do? You give it power. You give it the ability to actually have control over you. You make it where we are now vulnerable to its power. Now, you might be wondering, hold on, how is that? Well, let's turn over to 3 John chapter 1, verse 9. Over in 3 John chapter 1, verse 9, as we read here, I'm going to be reading this verse from the English Standard Version because I believe that it does a better way of explaining it. The English Standard Version here says, I have written something to the church, but the Tyrophesis, who likes to put himself first, he is self-centered, we see that, who likes to put himself first, so does not acknowledge our authority. What does his, his decision to put himself first do? Well, it makes it where he thinks he's the authority. He doesn't acknowledge somebody else's. We become vulnerable to these other powers when we don't acknowledge them. Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 through 28. Refusal to discuss this, this truly important topic. It's not just a refusal to talk about that, but it's a refusal to talk about what's at stake when it comes to it. If we just say that we're just not going to talk about something, what we're also saying is, I'm not going to talk about what's at stake with it. Over in Matthew chapter 16, in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus does indeed talk about it. He says in verse 24, we're going to read through verse 26 this morning. It says, then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Pay attention to verse 26 now. He says, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world? Well, that's really what we're looking to do in our self-centeredness. If he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul, what shall a man give in return for his soul? If we decide that we're not going to talk about steadfastness, or not steadfastness, pardon, self-centeredness, what do we do? Well, we refuse to talk about the fact, not, not, not theory, not, not comment, but the fact that what's at stake is our soul. But also, when we neglect to talk about it, it includes neglecting to specify it. It's not necessarily just that we neglect to, to bring up this, this idea of self-centeredness, because we really do. We bring it up, we talk about pride, don't we? We talk about how bad pride is, and oftentimes we, we kind of slowly slip self-centeredness into it. And we say, okay, see, we've talked about it. Well, what do we really talk about? Pride. If we refuse to specify and talk about it specifically, we give it power. Because, you know, when we talk about, about pride, it will, it will always include self-centeredness. But do you know what doesn't always include pride? Self-centeredness. Let's turn over to Luke chapter 9. Over here in Luke chapter 9, let's re begin reading in verse 57. Jesus is teaching disciples about what the cost is to follow him. And this is what he says. He says, as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead, but as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord. But let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. You know, these two examples, 
Do you see any pride? Is it prideful to, to desire and want to go bury your father? I, I would, wouldn't say so. I would say it's pretty sorrowful to want to go and bury your father. Is it prideful when we want or when we have to say goodbye to those who, who come visit? You know, the, this whole row that's sitting here, they're about to, to go away for a little while. I'm not going to be full of pride when I have to say goodbye to them. No matter how short of a time it might be, I'm going to be saddened. But what we see here is that they were indeed self-centered. Self-centeredness does not just mean that you have pride. It also has to do with where we put our focus. And we're going to look at that a little bit more later this morning. This morning, what we're going to do is talk about self-focus or self-centered. And we're going to determine and find out which one do we need to be. How do we need to carry ourselves and what do we need to do with our life? As we look at self-focus and self-centeredness, though, I want to start with self-centeredness. I want to start with it because, for one, one, I want to end on good stuff. There truly are evils to being self-centered. Self-centered is not something that we should ever desire to be. It's not something that we should ever look at and say, that is how I get ahead. Because it's not. As we look at this, we're going to be saying in the book of James, beginning in James chapter 3, verse 14. It says there, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. He says you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. Let's turn over. I'm going to turn over to the New King James Version real quick. I'm going to read from there as well. The New King James Version puts it this way. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. You see, self-centeredness, it creates, it puts these things in our life where we reject the truth. We reject the truth because maybe it doesn't fit with what I want it to say. How many do we see today who they want to believe that the love and the mercy and all the forgiveness and that, they want to believe that, but they don't want to believe the, the wrath and the punishment and that which comes to those who do not follow. They're self-centered. It is self-centered to want one and say, well, I'm going to accept this and I'm going to deny this. Because what do you do? You reject the truth. What do you do when you reject the truth? Well, oftentimes you'll, you'll go around and you'll either seek those who are, who are answering the questions we want the way we want, or will be the one going around and teaching the lies and boasting in these lies. Because when we begin to teach them, what do we do? Well, we provide the answers others want. They come and they say, I like this person. Look at how smart this person is. Look at how exalted this person is. And what do we do? Well, we become puffed up. Self-centeredness will prompt, will prompt pride. It will lead us to pride if we are not careful. Self-centeredness is also the, the center for all that is evil. Turn over to, or go down a few verses to verse 16. It says there, For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. You know, he doesn't say, and some evil things are there. He says, every. We brought it up before when we talk about sin. Sin is selfishness. That's it. Sin is selfishness. Sin is self-seeking. James chapter 3 verse 16 tells us that very clearly. But what happens when we are one who is solely focused on ourselves? What do we end up finding? We either are chasing our own desires or we're chasing that answer that we talked about already. We're chasing that answer that we want. 
We become like a chicken with its head cut off, running around not knowing where we're going. Or we become like a dog chasing its own tail, only never able to actually catch it. What we become is those who it talks about in Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, where it says that we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of man and the cunning craftiness and deceitful plotting. We become them who are, are tossed about. When these new ideas come about and, and, oh, all of a sudden this new idea fits me just a little bit better. I'm going to be carried away by that new idea. Look at what we live in today. New ideas springing up all the time because we are self-centered. You know, if that, those aren't bad enough, and in, I believe they are. I believe the scripture teaches us that they are. Let's look at another, James chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. In James chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, it says, Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasure. Look back. Look historically at the wars, at the fights, and all these things that happened. Why did they happen? They didn't happen because some president or some king or some dictator said, let me share everything that I have. They happened because some president or some king or some dictator said, I want more. I'm focused on what I want. The same happens with us Today, when we desire our, our values, those that we think are more important, when we look at them and say they are of more value than what somebody else wants, what ends up happening? Division, quarrels, fights, and yes, even fights and divisions among brethren. It's why it's so important when we read over in places like Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, where Paul tells the Philippians to do what? To do not count yourself as important, but to look out for the interests of others. And see them and say, they are of more value. This is exactly what we need to do. Because when we do it, what are we actually fighting against? Self-centeredness. Selfishness and sinfulness. But while we can look at the, the evils... It's just, if not more so important, for us to look at the good side of things, too. And self-focus is good. Self-focus is a good thing. Now, in order to actually truly look at this, we need to know that there's a difference. Somebody who is self-centered is somebody who's going to be concerned solely with one's own desires, needs, or interests. The important word there is solely. The other's needs, other's desires, they play no factor in their life. But somebody who is self-focused is somebody who brings attention, conscious attention, on their needs, on their desires, and on their emotions. What's the difference? Solely. Is it wrong to recognize that we have needs? Nope. Because we do. Don't. Is it wrong to recognize that, that we have desires? Nope. Is it wrong to only focus on them? Yep. We have to recognize that there is good. And there's good to self-focus because it can empower us. But let's explain how it does that. Let's explain how does self-focus empower. To answer this, we're going to turn over to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. It says, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Paul says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do 
for His good pleasure. Are we able to work out our own salvation if we don't focus and recognize that we have needs? No. Can I work out the fact that I need salvation if I don't recognize it? No. We must be able to recognize these things. We need to recognize that, that we have a need. Because when we look over in Romans chapter 14, verse 12, it tells us there that we have a need. We have a need because it says, So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. We're going to give account. I have a need because I'm going to give account. I have a need because if you look back in Romans chapter 3, what does it tell us? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I have a need because in my current state, in my sinful state, I cannot obtain salvation. And I should have a desire for salvation. I should have a desire to be in glory with God. You know what self-focus also does for us? Self-focus is also able to, to aid us and empower us to examine ourselves. We're told throughout Scripture that we need to examine ourselves. That we need to test the things that we hear. That we need to know if they are right or if they are wrong. Over in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 40. It says, Let us search out and examine our ways and turn back to the Lord. We've been reading in Haggai, in Haggai chapter 1, verse 5. It says, Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. They needed to examine the things that happened to them. And they needed to examine and focus on these things. Because they needed to know why did they happen to them. We need to examine our ways. We need to examine the things which we do. And we need to come to a, a realization, to an understanding, am I self-focused or am I self-centered? Which one am I? Because we need to be able to answer this. And if we are, are self-centered, we need to find a way to change it. But... How do we know which one we are? Now, we, we've used this word solely, right? Well, let's look at some, some scripture to help us with this. And scripture that we're going to look at this morning is over in Luke chapter 18. Over in Luke chapter 18, we're going to be reading the parable of the Pharisee and of the tax collector. And yes, we, we know this parable, don't we? We could probably maybe not recite it by heart, but we could recap it in detail by heart. But let's try to forget it for just a second. Act like we're hearing it for the very first time. And we're going to begin reading in verse 10 because verse 9 gives away the question we're going to ask. Let's begin reading in verse 10. It says, Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so, even, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, remember, if this is the first time that we've ever heard these words, what do we see? What do we see? Well, we see the Pharisee. He's the first one who's brought up. What does he do? He prays to God, and he prays to God with thankfulness. He says, I am thankful that I am not like these others, unjust, extortioners, adulterers, or this tax collector who, historically, would gather more than they had to and pocket it. Deceitful. He is thankful and he examines himself and says, look at these things that I've done. Do we need to examine the things that we have done in our life? Absolutely. 
We need to know if I need to go further, if I can go further. The reality, if you look over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18, what does it tell us to do? It tells us to pray always and tells us to pray with thankfulness. If this is all that we look at, we might actually say, okay, did you do anything wrong? Well, let's look at the tax collector. His prayer, he prayed for mercy. We find mercy mentioned throughout Scripture. Over in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13, it talks about mercy, how important it is. Look back at David and how he prays to God for forgiveness and recognizes the need he has for mercy. It's found throughout the Word. Is there anything wrong with that? No. So what was the difference in their prayer then? It wasn't what they said, was it? It wasn't what they said. It was the intention. Let's look at verse 14. It says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified. The tax collector went down to his house justified rather than the other man. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. The Pharisee went in, prayed thus with himself to do what? For what purpose? So that he may be exalted among men. While we look at the tax collector, he did the opposite. When we look at the decisions and the choices that we make, we need to go and, and examine. Take time to examine and say, why am I doing these things? The why before the what. Am I doing these things to, to help another or to help myself? Let's turn over Romans chapter 15. Over here in Romans chapter 15, verses 1 through 2, it says, We then, who are strong, ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Remember what he's talking about. He's talking about those who are weak, those who are of Jewish heritage, and they cannot eat the meat that is offered to idols, and so they say, we're going to be vegetarians. They are, they are weak in that area, but he tells them to bear with their scruples. And he tells them why, verse 2. Let each of us please his neighbor... For good, leading to edification. He tells them, you can eat the meat, but you need to put your neighbor, you need to put your brother first. Who am I trying to please? Am I trying to please myself, or am I trying to please my neighbor? That's not the only way that we can determine if our act is, is selfish or if it's focused. Let's turn back over to Luke chapter 9. Turning back over to Luke chapter 9, verses 57, 57 through 62. When we look at these examples, what do we find? We find a willingness of the people to follow Christ, don't we? They were. But we also find that there is something that got in their way when we look at those things that might get in our way we have to, to come to a, an understanding they might not be sinful they might not be prideful is it prideful that, that we might go through a time in our life when sleep is more important than being here I don't think it's necessarily prideful it's nothing to boast in but it is most certainly Selfish. So it's certainly important for us to see one act. One act is either going to prohibit me from worshiping God, from helping myself become a better servant of His. One act is going to prohibit, and the other can encourage. Despite the fact that, that we might come here and we might be tired, we might be worn out. We might have just gotten off a 12-hour shift, and then we come in, and we come here and sit down, and then you have to hear my voice, and that's never fun. You, know, you might be tired. But which one's really going to help us? Which one's going to edify? Are we really, do we really have to sit down and think about it? 
I think we know the answer already. But I said we were going to finish up this little mini-series talking about anxieties and worries. And we are. When we talk about being self-centered, what we actually are talking about is putting those worries and those things that we care about and holding them on such a pedestal and such a place in our life that all they will do is cause us to be in a state of constant worry, of constant anxiety, of constantly thinking, what's next? You know, when, I, when I'm truly worried, it's when there's some, some event happening that I don't know the outcome of yet. But those events are always physical. Each time, they are physical. Selfishness, self-centeredness, it creates us with the feeling, though we might not know it, it creates us with the feeling of powerlessness. Because when we try to put our strength and our trust in ourselves, we truly are powerless. We truly have none. But when we focus, when we recognize the needs, when we recognize it and put attention where we need to, it empowers us. It empowers us to overcome these worries that we might have because, because when we're not worried, when we're not worried about these, these selfish things and we are about the, the spiritual, what's the difference? These worldly things, I don't know an outcome. The spiritual things, I do. I know the outcome. No matter what spiritual thing it might be, I know the outcome. Because the scripture tells me. Because it teaches me. I want us to end in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. Here in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, it says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. We sometimes walk this life and, and live in fear. But you know what we don't have to do is exactly that. We don't have to be in fear. The remnant, as we looked at this morning in our Bible class, they feared. And what did God do? He encouraged them. He told them, you don't need the fear about the glory of this temple. You don't need to dread about the glory of this temple. Because I promise you, it will have more. We don't need to dread about what this life brings. Because he promises us that there is glory in something else. And it's glory that cannot be matched. Reality of it. After we look at all these things, and I even said that it doesn't do any good, but I think we need to hear it. We don't have to live in fear. We don't have to live in, in, in wonder and worry when think about what's coming next. Because we know. We know the true things, the best things in life that are. This morning, though, we offer the, the Lord's invitation as we do each and every first day of the week. Because it is, it is being joined to him. It is being raised to walk in newness of life in Christ that allows us to know the peace that exists. If you're one here this morning who has not yet been baptized, who's not yet put to death the old man, raised to walk in newness of life, and had felt that peace, then you need to this morning. We ask you to come forward. Or maybe we've done that, and maybe we have been a self-centered, selfish person. And maybe we need to make things right in a public manner. Maybe we have committed sins in a public manner. We ask and we plead you to come forward. Show that we can focus on the needs we have in needing our brethren and in needing forgiveness. Or maybe we need our brethren's prayers. Maybe we need each other to pray. We need strength. There is no shame in knowing that we need it. But it takes focus to see it. Whatever the case may be this morning, we ask you to come forward as we stand and as we sing.